Welcome to Wide Angle. Today, we are looking at the issue of evacuating Indians from conflict zones. For the last 10 days or more, we have the government, the media, and the people have been preoccupied with the problems being faced by the Indians in Iraq, particularly the Indians, the 46 nurses who were trapped in Tikrit. Just now we have received breaking news that they have been handed over to the Red Crescent authorities and hopefully are on their way home and we hope to be able to receive them in Kochi tomorrow morning. But let me now turn to the very distinguished panel that we have to discuss this issue with us. We have Vice Admiral Anup Singh from the Navy. We have uh, Mr. Rajiv Sikri, former Secretary of the Ministry of External Affairs. And we have Atul Aneja, Associate Editor of The Hindu. Atul, you were till recently yeah. the Hindu correspondent for West Asia based in the region. That's right. And you have been to uh, Iraq during yes. the course of your stay there. Can you give us an idea about the numbers of Indians, where they are, and what is happening there? You see, a large number of Indians would be there in the south because that's the area which has the largest number of uh, oil fields. So that's one area. That's Basra. That's Basra. And if you come north of Basra, then you will come up to Karbala <laughs> and Najaf. Uh, so these are the area, and Najaf and Karbala being pilgrim centers. There's also a floating population which keeps visiting these areas. True. So uh, that's one area. Then you have also in what, uh, what is the KRG, that Kurdish areas, which is Kirkuk and north of that. There is a concentration of population there. Mosul being the second largest city of Iraq. So there's which is currently under the control of the ISIS. That's correct. And there's a contest for that which is taking place with the Iraqi army, which has mounted a repose trying to take, uh, retake this, this city, which has been lost to ISIS. Though I find ISIS is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, there are there are Sunni tribes over there. There are Saddam's people who want to, uh, yes. uh, to be there uh, in in the political leadership, which this has been is the Naqshbandi army. That's as correct. It is so called. you know, ISIS uh, does that. There is a terror group which is controlling. I don't think that gives an accurate picture of what's happened. And the fact that the nurses have been released so quickly, I would not expect a terror group to do that. So there is something more to it than just the ISIS. There are, there are far more uh, forces which are working in Iraq. Uh, than, than just this group. But while the development regarding the 46 nurses is a very positive development, uh, there is still, we still have about 40 Indian workers who are believed uh, to be in Mosul who are being conscripted into labor in order to build fortifications. And uh, we don't know whether they are hostage or not hostage, but certainly um, their family members are extremely concerned about their welfare and safety. So uh, we still expect, hopefully, some positive developments on that front. Though Mosul is difficult because it's a large city, and that seems to be the bastion where they're going to fight back. Because once the Iraqi army advances, as they've done in Tikrit, uh, the ISIS and their supporters seem to be consolidating in Mosul. So this could be one of the central elements of the conflict zone of the future. So I'm not so sure whether we'll be able to take them out. But the example of nurses, probably there would be a silver lining. Well, case. we'll keep our fingers crossed. But Rajiv, if I may turn to you, in the ministry as secretary, you have handled uh, some of these complicated cases of evacuation. Yeah. And uh, the Lebanon case was one in particular. Can you, uh, that was in 2006, but can you just bring us back on uh, some of the issues that cropped up during that development? Well, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, this was a situation that was uh, uh, getting worse by the day and uh, we decided to take a little preemptive action and just in the nick of time, I recall that uh, uh, on a Sunday, I, I saw the situation was getting uh, quite bad, so early Monday morning, we, convened a meeting and uh, the Navy said that they had a few ships and Admiral Anoop was uh, the, the That commander. was coincidental. That's right. Uh, That's right. The thing. And they had just steamed through the Suez Canal and the Navy said, you know, we can send them back. So uh, it took us about a few hours to get all the clearances, but by the evening the clearances were there and then the whole machinery swung into action. Our ambassador in Beirut, uh, we had a, a place in Cyprus where uh, our ambassador was coordinating operations. Uh, the Navy was involved and they played a very helpful role. H here in India, we were coordinating with the Navy, with the Civil Aviation Authorities, Air India, 
uh, different governments because there's Egypt, Suez Canal, Israel because of the access to Lebanon and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it was a smooth operation, but uh, obviously the scale of the operation was nothing like uh, uh, what it was, say, in 1991 when the Kuwait evacuation took place or later True. on when the Libya evacuation took place. But this was a little more uh, uh, complicated because it was a constrained uh, uh, area. And uh, I'm glad that we, we, we managed to do that quite well. Just as I think yes. that this time around also, uh, as soon as we got news, I think that the MEA uh, swung into action quite effectively True. and worked out contingency plans, yes. which is why now that the nurses appear to have been released, that we have everything in place. And so it's a combination. I should also mention another incident uh, which happened in 2004, also in Iraq, when uh, four or five of our truck drivers were yes. captured. And that was a much trickier affair because they were actually being held for ransom and hostage and we had to do and a lot a of complicated negotiations. Complicated but nego uh, just to um, recall for our uh, viewers, in 2006, what had happened in Lebanon was that uh, there was a conflict that was taking place between Hezbollah and Israel. A blockade had been imposed. Uh, aerial bombardments were underway. And uh, there were about 10,000 Indians who uh, were at risk in Lebanon. And out of those, uh, the government of India, through its efforts, was able to evacuate 2,280 they were evacuated in two stages, first by sea from Lebanon to Cyprus and then by air from Cyprus back to India. So Admiral Anup Singh, you were commanding the fleet and you turned around the ships, went back through the Suez into the Mediterranean. I mean, was this the first time that you were uh, facing this kind of a challenge in your long and uh, distinguished career? Absolutely. Uh, and it came with no preparation, no warning. Of course, we were monitoring the BBC and uh, other news channels while passing south through the Suez Canal, preparing to go back to India after overseas deployment in the Mediterranean. Uh, this was, I remember, the 13th of July, and one day earlier we had heard that Israel had started carrying out attacks after kidnapping of his two soldiers by mm -hmm. suspected by the Hezbollah. And uh, we received the orders uh, in the middle of the Suez Canal. And the first indications that came from the, uh, uh, from the, U from the uh, Egyptian authorities was that it has never happened that ships are allowed to turn around, either within the Great Bitter Lake, where we had just entered at that time, or get permission so quickly. So it came as a pleasant surprise even to the embassy staff in Cairo that within a matter of 12 hours, mm -hmm. permission was granted for all four ships of the fleet um, to turn back in the northbound convoy the next morning at 6 o'clock. Uh, so it was very quick and it all credit goes to the Ministry of External Affairs and Ambassador Rajiv Sikri who was handling the whole show in Delhi. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, found it very, very uh, useful to get all the old uh, uh, cooperation yarns between, you, between the Egyptian authorities and us uh, activated at the time. But the point to be uh, remembered in this particular operation is that the, insofar as the Navy is concerned, it had done the 2004 Tsunami Act mm -hmm. uh, just two years earlier uh, and an evacuation of military personnel, mostly Army, from Somalia in 1992. But there's a stark difference between the two operations. Those two, first of all, the tsunami, even though once again we had never done a thing like that, and there were no SOPs of that kind, uh, required relief, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief to be landed, and some uh, succor to be provided to those people in terms of meals, tentage, etc., and some rescue operations. Uh, Somalia so did not require problems. It was a combination of different elements of disaster relief plus evacuation. Plus eva not not so much of evacuation. Was much more predominant. Yes, yes. And Somalia once again was military personnel and therefore problems like uh, invalid documents etc. did not arise. Also, travel documents, travel documents etc. did not arise because they were all military personnel, our military personnel doing peacekeeping. And they were lift airlifted by our own helicopters. And that country was at a... At in, in the process of a civil war. True. Whereas Hezbollah versus Israel, Israel was a two country war and this was the first time that 
any navy went into an active blockade. Yeah. And knowing the Israelis, the Israeli Defense Forces had such an active and solid blockade, which, which measured about 60 by 70 nautical miles outside Beirut. And they had, uh, they had, they had sort of a very hermetically sealed box through which with permissions we had to go in. So this also required enormous amount of coordination with the Israeli authorities, Absolutely. their yes. defense people, their naval authorities and so on f to enable the Indian warships uh, yeah. to approach Lebanese coastline. Atul, if I can come back to you, another um, major evacuation that was undertaken was in 2011, Operation Safe Homecoming. This was from Libya. Yeah. And uh, in a fairly short period of time, uh, we were able to evacuate uh, more than 16,000 Indians from Libya in a short spell of something like 10 to 12 days. Uh, can you uh, refresh our memory about uh, some of the aspects of the Libya operation, this Operation Safe Homecoming? Well, quite honestly, unlike 2006, when I was on the ground, when Admiral Anup Singh was doing his evacuation with Brahmaputra and uh, the Delhi class ships, uh, in this case, I, were, I was moving from Dubai to Alexandria and then crossing the saloon crossing towards Benghazi. Right. So the, most of this evacuation takes place from Tripoli side. Well, it took place from Tripoli and Benghazi mm -hmm. to Benghazi. Alexandria in Egypt. That's right. And then from Cairo or Alexandria, the air evacuation sure, took place. Sure, sure. So once again, just to uh, explain for our viewers, what was happening was that uh, you had uh, NATO airstrikes taking place on Libya. So the airspace was closed. Uh, some of the airports were not operational because their uh, runways had been bombed. And uh, we had something like 18,000 Indians who were at risk in Libya, and not all of them were in Tripoli. They were in Tripoli, they were in Sirte, they were in uh, Sabah, they were in uh, Benghazi, and uh, a few other uh, towns in Libya. So it was a major challenge first to ensure that we had uh, details of where we had the Indian community, and then to ensure to move them into safe locations and then f after moving them into safe locations, move them out of Libya. Yeah. Sorry, Atul. I, I just wanted to make no, that clear it, because it was some time back. It, it, it's, it's important and especially the Libyan, the Tripoli side, there was a separate uh, operation which was going on and the coastal and the naval uh, element comes in stronger over there. Then there's the land element which I saw firsthand. This is the Sudum crossing which is the border between uh, Egypt and Libya. Uh, from Alexandria, if you, it's about 700 odd kilometers. You have to cross that Al Alamein area. You know, this, and that's, that's a desert. Romel's, uh, route. No, that's not it. It's along the Mediterranean coast. Oh, it's you, along the coast. coast. Okay. So you keep coming along the coast, and then there is, a, a, you know, you have to climb up a bit, and then you come to this crossing, which is at a, a little bit of a higher altitude. And that's where you see the mess, because this place was full of refugees. Uh, by this time, uh, our embassy in Cairo had got its act together. So most of the Indians had already been moved from Saloom Crossing to Cairo and Alexandria from where Air India and other uh, flights took them back home. But this place, when I went there, was full of Bangladeshis. And they were founding, finding absolutely no support yes. over there. That and that's, is, a, that's it's important aspect. because you know, that's the difference with Op Sukun, mm, yes. where the ships were being loaded with Sri Lankans, Nepalese, and Bangladeshis. That's right. I know. But that's a subject which we'll come back to because very often in these situations, um, with the Indian resources, we also look after the citizens of Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh and uh, also bring them safely to their homes. But we'll come back to this after a short break. Mm -hmm.